10 things you need to do as a retiree in Singapore. Take out your notes, jot down what is important. Rewatch this a few times because I'll be going quite fast today. And it starts with this first point. Know how much you have in your CPF. Inside CPF all these years, you realize you have your CPF ordinary account, special account, and Medisave account. When you turn the age of 55, there's this new account called retirement account, which is meant to provide you some passive income in your retirement years. We'll get to that in a while. Once you're above the age of 55, if you are reliant on your CPF OA to pay for mortgage, this could be a problem. It's important to understand how much more mortgage you still have, how much cash you might need to set aside, because as how CPF is designed, OA and SA contributions will start to drop along the years, even if you are still working. And on this point on MediSafe, it's important to note that your insurance premiums and medical needs would depend on this account. So along these years, as you grow older, you would realize that your integrated shield plan premium is increasing. Do always check that you have enough in your MediSafe account. It pays 4% of interest. And if you have spare cash, you can always choose to top up to your MediSafe account and use it as a piggy bank for medical needs. Second thing to know as a retiree is how much CPF life will be coming to you from your age of 65. The amounts that are coming out will be formed from your retirement account, RA. And typically, tables like this would show how much you will get if you choose basic retirement sum, full retirement sum, or enhanced retirement sum. This amount again is not the newest for 2024, but it goes to show that if you contribute more to your RA and aim towards the limit of enhanced retirement sum, you can get a higher payout. As of this moment, I've also shared on Georgetown Finance Summit that topping up to retirement account doesn't seem to have a lot of incentive. If you're curious to learn a bit more on retirement planning, check out links below for Georgetown Finance Summit. These are snippets of what I shared with audiences and we had a full house back then. Point number three on what to note is wills and CPF nomination. Now I lump these two together because they manage monies, correct, when you pass away. But I'd like to draw some attention to this point. CPF nomination is outside of wills. These are exact wordings. CPF savings cannot be included in your will because they do not form your estate. What that means is do a will and also go and do your CPF nomination. Right now, actually, it's very simple to do CPF nomination. It can be done online and all the witnesses are just using SingPass. I've done through the process myself and it's pretty easy. If you are at an advanced age, maybe your spouse may have passed away, maybe your children may have migrated, circumstances will definitely have changed in one way or the other. So it may be time for you to relook at your CPF nomination because if it's not nominated, it will fall under the Interstate Succession Act. In the middle column, you realize that if you have spouse and children, if your CPF is not nominated, it will be shared equally. So maybe at this phase in life, if you want to pass everything to your spouse, the only way is to go and do these plannings correctly, your will and your CPF nomination, to do your CPF nomination and will. And with regards to will, wills allow you to list down your assets. And again, if you're unsure on how to do up your will, you like a referral, drop me an email to joshtantap, this is your parent, joshtantap at gmail.com. I have a specialized will writer to recommend to you who I think can simplify this entire process for you very easily. In your advanced years in retirement, it's not so much about guardianship of children, that's more for young parents like me, this life stage, but rather is to not have the money again in Intestate Succession Act. At this phase, you may want to distribute your monies a bit differently. And it got me to think about a recent event. I had a friend whose parent passed away and the sibling distribution was unequal. There feels to be a bit of a resentment which in my opinion is regrettable because a proper will can not only distribute amounts but also communicate last wishes. Point number four to note, lasting power of attorney, LPA. I had been a caregiver to my dad who is a stroke patient and I'm a big advocate of LPA because what it does for you is it donates the rights to make decisions to a trusted person to run your finances on your behalf. The usual question is what's the difference between LPA and will. Quite simply, will is when you pass away, correct? How to distribute what are the last wishes. LPA is when you're still around but not mentally able to make decisions. Who can step into your shoes and make those decisions on your behalf? So again, they address two very different needs. 
The next question usually is, is LPA free or not? Unfortunately, there was a previous free period, but right now LPA requires certain fees in terms of applications and also in terms of getting someone to certify it. The person certifying can be a doctor, lawyer, or a qualified personnel. In your retirement years, it is important to make sure that your LPA is done because you can have money. But if you do not do LPA and you become a stroke patient, for example, no one can really make use of the money for you to take care of you and no one can actually make property decisions for you. So the older you get, the more this risk becomes prominent. The amount it costs can really save a lot of headaches, so don't sting on it. And as always, if you have learned something already, smash the like button and share this entire video with someone who's in retirement years that should hear a thing or two. And also, if you like a full fee-based retirement planning, look for my links below on how to get in touch. I can map out how to build up a proper retirement and advise you especially on how to decumulate. Point number five on what to take note as a retiree is AMD and ACP. AMD again is not advanced micro devices. This is a very hot semiconductor stock right now in US. It's not. AMD stands for Advanced Medical Directive. ACP on the other hand stands for Advanced Care Planning. So what's the difference between AMD and ACP? ACP is not a legal document. It's an ongoing communication for patients to bring their families together to explain what they wish. Both of them are tools to indicate your preferences for medical care for future contingencies when you're not able to make decisions. My wife happens to be in the healthcare profession and in my opinion, ACP is especially useful when a parent can't really communicate some of their wishes to their children in a normal setting. Therefore, a clinical setting comes in to facilitate discussion. Again, ACP is not a legal document, but AMD on the other hand is an official one. If you read over here, it states if I should suffer from terminal illness and if I should become unconscious or incapable of exercising rational judgment, this is my decision on life-sustaining treatment. At this stage, in my opinion, I value the use of LPA a bit more than AMD, although they fulfill different objectives, because in my opinion, AMD, if you are okay to put your life decision in someone else's hands, it may not be that crucial. But on the other hand, LPA is a bit different. Children might want to help make decisions on money and house, but cannot, they are stuck. LPA gives them the power. It solves financial problems and squabbles. Let's go on to point number six, which is to properly manage your insurance. As a working adult, it's more about death coverage, which is to cover liabilities, and critical illness coverage, which in my opinion is to protect long-term loss of income. But in retirement, these two objectives are not too much of an issue, correct? There's no more liability, hopefully, and there's no more income, retired already, what? So the key insurance to hold on to is actually in the medical insurance. Something I mentioned on point number one, which is know exactly how much you have in CPF. Not only that, know what is your medical insurance coverage and the benefits it delivers to you. Integrated shoe plans have been changing a lot in the last 3-4 years. In my field of work, I've also seen before lapses in policies because when you go to a different age band, there could be cash premiums coming in and very often people neglect letters of outstanding premium because they assume everything was tied to Medisafe. It may not be true. When you go to a different age tier, some portions of premium might become cash and you have to take note of these to ensure your policy does not lapse. In an elderly age, you should also have accident insurance. It becomes very important because an elderly person is prone to falling. At this elderly age, it's also different from your working years where there's corporate coverage. Right now, you're on your own. Medical insurance covers for inpatient mainly. Accident plans covers for dislocations, bruises, physiotherapy. And all this is meant to save you long-term cost. Point number seven, have a safe and more importantly, have someone who knows the pin also. You know, throughout these years, you have accumulated some valuables, jewelry, expensive watches, put them into a safe. Put also your will document in. I'm an advocate of now having a permanent safe at home because renting does not seem that feasible to save long-term costs. And I believe that when I'm older, I'll definitely buy one to install at home. The second part again is to remind someone of the pin to the safe so that in the event of your passing away, 
at least somebody can retrieve the things that is inside. Point number eight, have a joint account with your child or surviving spouse. Now, many know this as a shortcut to easy access to money just in case the elderly person can't function already. Having someone as a joint account holder allows them to help you make payments, verify payments, and move monies in and out for day-to-day -day needs. So the key part you need to do as a retiree is to ensure that there's enough money inside and communicate to your joint account holder what to use it for. Point number nine, simplify your finances. Now along these years, if you've been doing well, you may have multiple bank accounts, OCBC, DBS, UOB, Citibank, etc. and etc. I've seen before people with 10 accounts who have lost track on some of their accounts because when there's a promotion, they sign up, they put small amounts in and along the years, they kind of suddenly remember they used to have an account there. Take note again, in your advanced years, your mental ability is different. You would forget things. It's normal. So what I'll suggest is start to close these small accounts, merge them because it's very difficult to manage everything. You can't even write down all your bank accounts if you have 10 into a wheel that easily. More crucially, when you pass away and your executor doesn't know that you have a bank account in XYZ Bank, then there's going to be a problem, correct? So what I'll suggest is to merge all these small accounts into a joint account and prepare for contingency. When you are dependent on a person who can be a child, nephew, niece, they are also busy and stressed. And if you're unwell, they have to manage maid, doctor's appointment, buying diapers, buying medicine, etc, etc. The last thing they need is to face problems managing your money. So simplify your finances and also clear away any loans and margins that you have in trading accounts. Simplify it, put things into a few key bank accounts of which one should be the joint account. Point number 10, lock up monies in your main savings account. Recently, there's this new initiative, which is a security feature to let bank customers lock up savings for in-person access only. Fantastic. I fully agree on that. If you're well-to-do enough, what you need is just a bank account that can manage month-to-month -month expenses, but the majority of savings should be locked up and not easily accessed so that you can be safe from scammers, correct? Now, as mentioned in this article, by setting a DG vote, customers can limit the risk exposure to their monies and they will be required to access it only with an ATM or at the bank counter. You know, at a recent Google Creator Summit, I've actually asked Minister Sun Xueling, could we feedback to CPF to have some locks in terms of money? Because CPF, when you have above full thumb sum, your OA and SA can be redrawn, correct? That's actually how some people got scammed. So I think the answer now is yes. I believe in a matter of time, this opt-in feature for CPF would also come to fruition. So again, if you have learned something or agree on some of the points, help me smash the like button so we can reach a bigger audience together. And since you stayed right to the very end, I have a bonus tip for you. Have a decumulation plan. You have saved up hard all these years. Now, when it's time to use it, you shouldn't leave it to chance, correct? So as the saying goes, when you do have a plan, you plan to fail. I've seen many retirees hold on to our savings and feel uncomfortable on spending it down. That's a bit of my work on a fee-based retirement planning perspective. I believe that many affluent retirees under-consume their monies and die with too much. Hopefully that's food for thought and as always, check out this previous video which relates on 8 happy things that retirees should take note. I'll see you there too and sign up from here. Take care as always, goodbye.